Our common perception of the Egyptians is of a cultured civilization, an educated people who worshipped their gods and rose to great heights of sophistication. Yet there is fascinating evidence which reveals they were also a warfaring people who developed advanced weapon-making techniques to become a devastating military force. By around 1200 BC, the Egyptians had a powerful neighbour who posed a specific threat. The hostile civilization was the mighty Hittites. They were both forces to be reckoned with. The Hittite kingdom had at its height controlled large swathes of the country now known as Turkey, as far east as the Euphrates River and as far south to the Egyptian border to the lands we now know as Syria. The earliest record of their existence is from 1900 BC and they were a powerful force for over 700 years. This amazing site is still producing a constant stream of evidence of weapons and ancient artefacts and architecture. Archaeologists have used the data to recreate these imposing city walls and give us a glimpse of the impressive size and power of the city. They have discovered some rare and intriguing finds which show the Hittites' level of craftsmanship in their weaponry. They include superb bronze arrow and spearheads, cutting knives and an extremely well-preserved 3,000-year-old axe head. One particularly revealing find was a magnificent stone carving found on a wall 10 miles north of Hattusha, which shows the curved swords used by the Hittites in battle. In contrast, the Egyptian army of this period were an infantry force of bowmen, spearmen and archers. For thousands of years, the Egyptians had not needed to significantly develop their weapons, as their enemies were no more advanced than themselves. This would change, however, when they came into major conflict with the Hittites. But there was one Egyptian ruler who would realise the importance of arming the country with cutting-edge military technology in order to survive and prosper. The great Egyptian leader Ramesses II instigated huge changes in military technology and strategy in order for the Egyptians to retain their power. One of the first things that Ramesses had to do was to face a new threat to Egypt, and this was the Hittite Empire. They were the new emerging power in the Middle East, and they were attacking the boundaries of Egypt and disrupting the trade into Egypt. But how would the Egyptians tackle this difficult task? Under Ramesses, they began by capturing, then adapting, their enemy's weapons. One of the most dangerous weapons developed by the Egyptians was the penetrative axe. In Cairo Museum, there is a spectacular example of a 3,500-year-old ceremonial axe. So fine was the precision of the weapon maker that the axe is still sharp today. The combining of different metals to make stronger weapons became key. When we're reproducing things like this, the technology is exactly the same. We use open fires and moulds. We're still discovering things that we've actually forgotten that they used over uh, 2,000 years ago. This is a bronze Egyptian penetrative axe. As far as we can gather, it probably would have been used on fleeing and wounded uh, opponents. The use of bronze ensured that the axe heads were stronger and would keep their sharp edges for longer. In the right hands, they were lethal. Ramesses II demanded the best weapon technology available for his troops, but he was up against great competition. Weapons such as the Kapesh were a great challenge. Its curved shape derived originally from a farming sickle used to cut crops. Although it had humble origins, the Kapesh was in fact an extremely effective and versatile weapon. The cutting edge is actually on the outside of the curve. This is a straight edge sword, probably been brought in by mercenaries, based on a Greek design really. The Romans also used swords similar to this and they were used throughout Europe. Their skill was far superior to ours in a lot of respects. And we have definitely lost some of the technology and we're actually now rediscovering it. These 3,000-year-old swords are the type to have been favoured by Ramesses II. They are European straight swords, which were tapered to a point with the centre of gravity at the back. They were lightweight and could be used by the average infantryman for fencing. 
Their slashing power made them a deadly weapon. The Hittites and other enemies of the Egyptians favoured a straight sword. It's a good thrusting sword, but in open combat it can still be used to slash. So it still has a cutting capacity. It's a dual purpose weapon. The Egyptians favoured the Kopesh. It has this curved blade. And the thing about curved blades is, as they lay on the flesh, they naturally impart a slicing motion. They're technically more efficient at the cut. I've looked at these on the wall carvings for years and always thought they were a rather primitive, like a sickle. They've just picked up an agricultural tool. It was a, a primitive, ungainly, ugly weapon. But this fine reproduction tells me it's a really beautifully designed weapon. In fact, it's almost perfectly designed because it has every function. I can still thrust with it because the curve is so created that the thrusting point is a direct line from my shoulder. And it's also got this little hook so I can get in, I can hook an enemy's shield, bring it down and jab him in the face. And if that hasn't done it, slash open his jaw. I think this would be my weapon of choice. One of the most highly developed weapons which would impact on the battlefield was the composite bow. The Egyptians used simple bows which were between three to six feet in length, but these would be outperformed by the more powerful composite bow. It was constructed to achieve the greatest possible range whilst retaining a manageable size and weight. Inside here is an extremely sophisticated piece of engineering. The engine of the bow is created using thin strips of buffalo horn, which keep their shape and act as a powerful spring during firing. The horn was attached to a preformed piece of wood with resin and left to set for a month. Once that's set, then the string comes off and that's, that's a bonded unit. Your horn's there. You've got a powerful spring, but there's so much energy locked up in there that it will explode on release and could break. To bind the structure together, animal sinew was used. Beaten until fibrous, it was bound around the main structure to give it strength. These are incredibly strong fibres that resist tension. And eventually, it's going to look something like this. And this is then layered on the composite of wood and horn, and it gives strength and protection to the whole structure. The composite bow would take 18 months to complete, so they were a precious and revered weapon. These extremely ornate composite bows were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun and are some of the finest examples ever discovered. The composite bow was the most powerful ancient bow to exist. Its design was developed over thousands of years until it was perfect. But how powerful was it? This is a bow of the Mongolian type. It's a horse archer's bow, designed to be used from horseback. These that you see here are sears, and they're held to the bow by the knee, and they extend extra energy to the bow once it's drawn back. They give you a virtually unlimited draw right back across the chest, and that's when the bow really starts working. That's when the sears impart the energy to the bow. This is a, a modern composite, it's a copy, and it's made with modern materials, which are, which are quite good, but not as good as the original materials. They were made by craftsmen. They were very, very, very potent. I would say you're probably looking at something twice as powerful as, as what we use now. The speed of the arrow leaving the bow is incredibly fast, yet only when we film at high speed and slow down the image can we see how effective and highly engineered this weapon really is. Action! You can already see the sears there, the slight sears starting to come in. Once the arrow is released, it actually bends around the bow to allow it to carry on straight. And then what it does is what we call fishtail from side to side until it straightens up. 
and you'd probably be looking at probably close to 300 feet per second for an hour. 300 feet per second, that's over 200 miles per hour. The impact from such a weapon would be fatal. In the ancient world, chariots became the most important piece of military equipment that a superpower could possess. Chariots evolved over time from what was initially quite a clumsy um, cart with, with solid wheels and so on into eventually the ultimate war machine, very lightly built, very efficient. It was probably the most complex object that anybody in the ancient world ever attempted to construct. The warrior pharaohs of Egypt came into conflict with enemies who were using fleets of chariots in battle. They began to build up their own chariot corps through trade and seizure. Once they had mastered the art of chariot building, the Egyptians developed their own vast fleets. Images on tombs show mass production of war chariots being manufactured ready for battle. The beauty of the Egyptian chariots was that they were strong but extremely lightweight and manoeuvrable. In contrast, the Hittite chariots were much heavier and more solid. They were good for charging through ranks, but much slower. Each had their merits. By positioning the axle further back on their war chariots, the Egyptians created a chariot which had a much sharper turning circle, allowing them to move quickly. Yet the Hittite chariot's heavier axle enabled them to carry a third man into battle. You look at the Hittite chariots and essentially you've got somebody with a spear, somebody with a shield and so on. Um, they just don't seem to have had the same brilliant conception of the chariot as a way of moving your archers very rapidly around the, the, the battlefield. The superior speed of the Egyptian chariots gave them a great advantage. Although only carrying two men, they could escape their enemies quickly by moving out of range or making lightning surprise attacks. War has always been the catalyst for technological breakthroughs. The inventions of ancient wars lay the foundations for military technology for thousands of years. What new inventions remain to be rediscovered in modern times and make us rethink everything we thought we knew about the ancient world?